In this experiment, we will look at the lethal effect of UV light on bacteria and see how UV light affects bacterial growth. So the purpose of this experiment is to determine the effectiveness of UV light on two different cell types. Namely, we will be comparing endospores versus vegetative cells. Now you might recall back to our discussion on endospores. Endospores are a structure that some bacteria produce in response to harsh conditions. And primarily that would be found in Bacillus and Clostridium um, uh, genus. And the endospores is a structure made of keratin. And again, it's produced in response to harsh conditions and it allows bacteria to wait out until conditions become favorable. That's in comparison to the vegetative cells which are the cells that are metabolically active. And so we want to see in this experiment if endospores or vegetative cells are more resistant to the effect of UV light. So what you would do in this is every person would be given one plate. And on the auger side of the plate, you would draw a line down the middle and you would divide your plate into two halves. So here's our line you're gonna divide your plate into two halves. One side, you're gonna label no UV, and that side of the plate is gonna be covered and it would be protected from the UV light. The other side of the plate would be labeled UV, and you would write down the exposure that you're given. So the way this would be done, would this would be a class data set. So half of the class would have vegetative cells, half of the class would have endospores, and then you would be assigned these different exposure times. So you could end up with the vegetative cells with a two second exposure. Um, you could have been assigned the vegetative cells with the four second exposure, et cetera, so on and so forth. So whatever you are assigned would be what you would write for your exposure time. That's the amount of time that you would subject this bacteria to the UV light. So on this one, I would be doing the endospores, so I would do bacillus coagulans endospores, and I would um, expose my plate to UV light for four seconds. That would be my contribution to the data set. I would also label my plate with my initials, uh, my lab day and time, as well as the date, right? And again, you would always wanna label along the edge of the plate so that you're not covering up um, what's going on on the plate. So you would label your plate according to this diagram. Then you would take your plate and now turn it over and put it auger side down. So now the lid is on the top and you're ready to swab your plate. Now using your aseptic technique, you would take a sterile swab and you would dip the sterile swab into the bacterial culture you would gently push the swab against the inside tube um, to get rid of any excess liquid so that your swab is not dripping wet when you go to transfer the swab onto the plate. So you would gently push the swab against the edge of the tube to get rid of any excess, and then you would take your swab and you would go with your swab side to side, side to side, back and forth, back and forth, covering the whole plate. Now, you would notice when doing this that it's really difficult to get to the bottom of the plate when you're swabbing side to side. So what you would do would be that you would rotate your plate, so you would turn your plate 90 degrees and then go side to side, side to side, side to side. Notice now I would touch that part of the plate that didn't get touched. So I'd go side to side, side to side as much as I could. I would then rotate my plate one more time and then side to side, side to side, side to side. And again, that would allow me to cover the entire surface of that plate. The idea is you want that bacteria to be all over the plate and evenly distributed into what we call a lawn. So you would make your swab of your plate. You would have bacteria on both sides. Then you would take your plate over to the UV lamp. And I have an animation to show you this in a minute, um, as well as a video that I am linking on the Canvas page um, that kind of shows you what this experiment actually looks like. And so you would take your plate over to the UV light. You would put a glove on the hand 
that would be putting the plate under the UV light. This UV lamp that we would be using is very high energy and you would not want to expose your skin to that UV light. So you would put a glove on the hand that's going to um, push the plate under the lamp. You would want to wear goggles. Goggles are gonna protect your eyes from that UV light. And then what you would do is you would remove the plate, or sorry, remove the lid from your plate. And the reason that you have to remove the lid is that UV light is not very penetrating. If you were to accidentally leave the lid, the plastic lid on, and then put your plate under the UV light, the light would not be able, the UV light would not be able to penetrate that lid and you wouldn't have a UV exposure. So you have to take the lid off to do this. And then we have a mask that covers half the plate. So it's this little half circle and it's going to cover um, the no UV side of the plate because what it's doing is, is that's going to act as a shield to protect half of the plate right? And remember I said that UV light is not very penetrating. So when you put that shield over half the plate, it's protecting it from UV exposure so that you have a comparison of the no UV light with the UV side. So you would put the mask to cover half the plate and then you would take your plate with your gloved hand and you would slide your plate under the lamp and you would leave it under there for your exposure time. Whether you have the two second exposure or the four second, you would set a timer and you would leave your plate under there for the assigned amount of time. After that amount of time is up, you would take your plate out from underneath the light using your gloved hand, again, to protect your skin. Take your plate out, take the mask off, you're done with the mask. You would put the lid back on right? Because we always want to incubate with the lid on. So you would put your lid back on your plate. Then you would turn your plate over auger side up and you would put it in the incubator auger side up. Remember that we always incubate our plates auger side up. So I would take my lid, put it on, put my plate auger side up and I would stick it in the incubator and we would allow them to grow for 48 hours and then come back and look at the results. And so at the end of this video, we will talk about what the results of this experiment would look like. So this is just a little animation that I created just to kind of show you an overview of how this procedure works. Again, if you look on the bottom of the slide, you'll see a link down here to a YouTube video. And this is basically a video that somebody else made that is showing how the procedure is done. So it's just an additional way for you to see the procedure done um, in a real lab setting. But this is just a very simplified diagram. So you have your plate, and again, half of your plate would be labeled UV. The other half of your plate would be labeled no UV. And you would take your swab and you would swab your entire plate, right? So that's obviously oversimplified. You would need to swab this back and forth many, many times to get your bacteria all over your plate. So you would swab your plate. Then you would take your lid off and put your UV mask on. So this would be our plate um, the, or the mask that we would cover. And we would cover the half of the plate that has no UV, right? Because if this mask is covering this part of the plate, there's gonna be no UV exposure um, to the side of the plate. So we put the mask on, then we take the plate and we put it under the UV lamp. And we would expose it or leave the plate under the lamp for our assigned time. So like in the last diagram, my assigned time was four seconds. So I would set a timer, four seconds. After four seconds, I would remove my plate from under the UV lamp. I would take my shield off, my mask, the part that's covering the plate. And then that would be followed by putting the lid back on, incubating auger side up. And so this would be how you would set up your UV experiment. So let's look at some background information about why UV light is damaging to cells. And so the first thing that we need to talk about is that uh, radiation um, occurs in, uh, or it travels in waves. 
And so when we refer to a wavelength, what we're talking about is the distance between the peaks. So if we were to look at our visible light, visible light are the colors of light that we see and the color we would perceive them. So 750 nanometers would correspond to red light, meaning we would perceive that as being red. And the 750 nanometers is referring to the distance between the peaks. So for red light, the distance between that peak would be approximately, in some cases, 750 nanometers. On the flip side, if we look at violet light, violet light has a wavelength of 400 nanometers. So what that means is that the distance between the peaks is much smaller. Now, just to give you an idea of a nanometer, um, one nanometer is equal to one billionth of a meter. So a nanometer is a very, very small um, amount. And just to give you another piece of information to kind of put that in perspective, um, one micrometer, so the, approximately the size of an E. coli, one E. coli is a thousand nanometers. So just to give you an idea, so we're smaller than that. Um, and these lights are going to travel in these wavelengths. Now, the greater the wavelength, so the higher the wavelength, whoops, the higher the wavelength is the lower the energy. They're what we call inversely related, meaning as the wavelength goes up, energy goes down. And on the flip side, the lower the wavelength, the higher the energy. So if we look at our visible spectrum in terms of um, in terms of our colors of light, you can think of this as Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Violet is going to have the smallest wavelengths. Uh, red is going to have the largest wavelengths. And so the visible light is only a small portion of these uh, peaks. And so if we look at other types of radiation, we have um, infrared, we have microwaves, we have radio waves. Those are gonna be larger wavelengths and therefore lower energy. So they're very low energy wavelengths. Whereas gamma rays, X-rays, and UV light have very small wavelengths. And as a result, because of their small wavelengths, they're very high energy, right? If you think of an X-ray, people take precautions. You can't be in an X-ray for a long period of time, right? The people that are the, the X-ray technicians that are doing the X-rays, they're wearing shields to protect themselves because you need to minimize your exposure to X-rays because X-rays are high energy um, wavelengths. UV light is also damaging. Think about yourself. Not only is it damaging to bacteria, but it's also damaging to your cells. And so if you think about, you know, why you shouldn't go out in the sun for long periods of time, probably the first thing that comes to your mind as to why you shouldn't go out in the sun for very long is skin cancer, right? We all know that if you get too much sun exposure, you increase your risk for skin cancer. Now, why does that happen? Well, UV light is high energy. And so when that high energy uh, light, it's going to hit your DNA, it's high energy, and it causes DNA to form what are called thymine thymine dimers. You're gonna see a picture of this in a minute, but it basically takes two thymines and DNA that are next to each other, and it's gonna form a covalent bond between those thymines. Now, the problem with that is that normally when our cell goes to divide, in order for the cell to divide, it has to first replicate their DNA. So an enzyme called DNA polymerase comes in, the two strands of DNA separate, they serve as templates to make new DNA strands. When DNA polymerase would get to a T, T normally pairs with A. So normally polymerase would read the T and it would pair it with an A. However, when we have those thymine thymine dimers, when we have those two thymines that are covalently bound to one another, 
when DNA polymerase gets to that part of the DNA, it doesn't know what to do with that. It doesn't recognize that as being a T anymore. It doesn't look the same. And so DNA polymerase is like, I don't know what to do. And so it puts in a random nucleotide. It could, instead of pairing a T with an A, it might now pair a T with a G, for example. When you get that change in your DNA sequence, that's referred to as a mutation. And so when we get a lot of sun exposure, that sun exposure can damage our DNA. It can cause mutations. And if those mutations happen to occur in a gene that controls cell division, meaning it tells the cell to divide or it tells the cell to not divide, if that mutation happens to occur in one of these genes and you acquire several of these mutations off often, it's not usually enough to only have one mutation. You have to accumulate um, mutations, which is why it's not like you go in the sun once and you get cancer. It's usually an accumulation over a period of time. And so when you accumulate these mutations and you get changes to those DNA sequences, that also then leads to changes in protein expression. And now the cells are getting the wrong signals. And so they might be getting the signal to divide all the time. They might have a mutation in their protein that tells the cell not to divide. But basically by the UV light hitting these cells, it mutates the DNA. When it mutates the DNA, it then can lead to cells growing out of control, unchecked, and that is cancer. So UV light is not only bad for our cells, it's also damaging to bacterial cells as well. And so if we look at UV light, UV light comes in three types. We have UVC, and UVC light is between 100 and 280 nanometers. UVB is 280 to 315. UVA is going to be 315 to about 410 approximately, so nanometers. So notice that if you look at the UV in sunlight, sunlight is primarily, uh, it's primarily UVA. So 315, right, so right about here, uh, 315 to 410 is UVA. The sun does contain some UVB. Um, tanning beds also have a higher percentage of UVB light, which is why you tan faster, which is also why it's more damaging to your skin. Um, and then UVC light has the smallest wavelengths, but it's the highest energy. And so you'll notice that if you look at this diagram um, on this far end here, you see it's labeled as what we call bacteriocidal. Cidal means kill, meaning UVC light is so high energy that it, it actually kills the bacteria. It causes the bacteria to die. And so we're gonna talk about kind of how this works um, and how cells can overcome some UV exposure. So the intracellular target of UV, again, is DNA. So the UV light is going to have the biggest effect on the DNA. And that's because, again, if we look here, let's put on my laser pointer. If you look here, so here is your DNA strand. And remember that DNA is a nucleic acid. Nucleic acids have three components to a nucleotide. It has a sugar. So a pentose five carbon sugar, it has a phosphate, and it has a nitrogenous base. And so these nucleotides are linked together by a phosphodiester linkage. And what you get is you get this backbone of DNA that's alternating sugar and phosphate. So sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And then the bases stick out and they form kind of the rungs of the ladder. So if you think of DNA, DNA would be a double helix. So this is simplifying, it's only showing one of the two strands, the other strand is not being shown. But normally for DNA, this T would be paired with an A, and this T would be paired with an A. 
However, when exposed to UV light, you get this thymine thymine dimer. You get this covalent bond that links these thymines together. So now when DNA polymerase comes along, it's going to read the T, but it doesn't recognize it's a T. And so DNA polymerase goes, I don't know, I'm going to pair it with G. So this now T might be paired with a G instead of normally being paired with an A. When that happens, that again is called a mutation. It causes DNA to mutate. And if too much mutation occurs, it can cause the cell to die. Now, practical uses of UV light. So UV light can be used in a hospital setting. So in addition to simply cleaning the room with disinfectant, they also have these UV lamps that they will bring into the room. And the UV lamp will basically help to kill other microbes that might be in the air or might be on surfaces that, that haven't been cleaned. And so UV light can actually be useful in a hospital setting um, to help kind of decontaminate um, a patient's room, for example, to help prevent and protect against the spread of those infections. And so this is a practical application of UV light. Now again, UV light is very is not very penetrating. So if you were, let's say, trying to use it to sterilize media, if you were making plates, for example, it's not going to be very effective because it's not going to be able to penetrate that flask to be able to sterilize your media. So this is not a method that's used to sterilize uh, media typically. Again, that would be using an autoclave. Um, but UV light does have its, um, it does have its purpose. So you can see it in a hospital setting, um, in lecture when talking about biosafety levels. Um, UV lamps can be found in biosafety cabinets where we culture microbes um, and it's used in those cabinets to help sterilize um, that cabinet and to make sure that your surface is clean when you're handling bacteria, etc. And so this is how UV light works. This is how UV um, damages the cells. Now, cells have mechanisms to repair damage, meaning that they can actually recognize when mutations have occurred or when DNA has become damaged. And when they recognize those changes, they can repair it. So DNA polymerase, for example, does make mistakes sometimes, and that those mistakes can be repaired. Now, in terms of UV repair mechanisms, there's two main types of repair mechanisms. The first is referred to as light-dependent repair, meaning that it requires light. It has what's called photoactivation. And so what that means is that following exposure to sunlight, an enzyme called photolyase becomes activated. So the sunlight itself actually activates this repair enzyme. So pho photolyase becomes activated and it functions to directly, depair, to directly repair thymine thymine dimers. So in response to light, it activates this enzyme. This enzyme can go in and directly repair thymine thymine dimers. We have this, and so does E. coli, for example. So this is a way that our cells can repair uh, UV damage. Light-independent repair, otherwise known as dark repair, um, uses various enzymes such as endonucleases. These are basically enzymes that will um, cut damaged DNA. They will use polymerases, which will synthesize new DNA and they will use ligase, which joins the fragments together. And so what you can see is here's a fragment of DNA, here's that thymine thymine dimer. And so these endonucleases come in, they recognize this damaged piece, they cut the, the DNA, right? So they're gonna cut the DNA. They're going to excise or remove that damaged piece of DNA. So there's an enzyme called helicase, which is used to unwind the DNA. It's going to remove that damaged piece. Now an enzyme called DNA polymerase 1 is going to come in and it's going to read um, the strand and it's going to synthesize the complementary um, nucleotides. 
And then we need to seal those fragments using an enzyme called DNA ligase. And so this is referred to as the dark repair or light independent, meaning it doesn't need to have light to activate this mechanism. And it's used to repair um, UV damage in DNA. And so these are two methods that cells have to try and repair damage to DNA. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of UV exposure, right, and you get too many, you accumulate too many damages, too many parts of the DNA that get damaged, these enzymes are not going to be able to keep up with that. And it's going to cause changes that can't be fixed. So this next part is looking at the data that you would get if you were doing this experiment. So this is going to be the data for day two to show you what your results would look like had you been able to set up this experiment yourself. And so I'm going to show you some plates and explain how this works. So what you're looking at is the top row are all of the vegetative samples. So here are the vegetative samples. The bottom row is showing you the endospores. And so notice on the left, it says unexposed, meaning that that's the part of the plate that was covered by the mask. It was shielded from the UV light. And the side on the right is the exposed side, meaning this was the side that was exposed to the UV light. So what you're looking at is for this top plate, this is a vegetative cell. And this plate had the exposed side exposed for two seconds to that UV light. If you look over here for the vegetative cells for four seconds, you can see that you get less growth. So the UV light is starting to kill the bacteria more. If we look at eight seconds, notice that our number of colonies is decreasing. 15 seconds, we get even less. Uh, 30 seconds, we get even less, right? Each of these colonies out here represents a mutant that is able to withstand the UV light. So we have some bacteria that can withstand the UV light. 60 seconds, we end up with one, maybe a couple small colonies on the edge of the plate, but again, not very much. And for our vegetative cells, by 90 seconds, we've pretty much gotten rid of most bacterial growth. Now, compare that with what we're looking at down here, which is the endospores. Notice that the times, this says two seconds, this says 15. So you have to pay close attention to um, these numbers to recognize that these don't match up. So this exposure is not the same as this one. So the endospore at 15 seconds, compare that to the vegetative cells at 15 seconds. And so what you'll notice is that the vegetative cells at 15 seconds have a lot less growth than the endospores. And so what that tells us is that the endospores are more resistant to UV light, which makes sense, right? Because endospores are a structure made of keratin that bacteria produce when conditions become harsh. UV light would be considered a harsh condition. It's there to protect the bacteria um, from the UV light. So if we compare the 15 and 15, you'll see that there's quite a big difference between the endospore producing and the vegetative. If you compare the 30 second exposure, so here's the 30 second exposure, look at how little is on the vegetative cell or vegetative plate at 30 seconds. If we look at 60 seconds, we still have quite a bit of growth, yet the vegetative cells have very, very little. And so what you'll notice is on average, typically, um, endospores are about tenfold more resistant to UV light than the vegetative cells. And you can actually see that represented on these plates. So notice if you look for your vegetative cells for 90 seconds, you don't see much. You still have quite a bit of growth um, on your endospore 90 seconds. Um, endospores at 120 seconds, we still have growth. 180, we still have growth. But by the time we get to about 240 seconds or about four minutes, that is enough of an exposure to kill even the endospores. And so the, the amount of time that you expose the UV to 
is going to be dependent on the type of cells, right? Endospores are going to be much, much more resistant to UV light than the vegetative cells. And so let's put that in a uh, table just to kind of quantitate and compare how much growth we got on each of these plates. So what I'll do is I will give the ones with the most growth, so these would get like four plus. Um, as we start to get less and less growth, we'll give it a three plus or a two plus, depending on the amount of growth. Now notice this is very subjective when I give them a plus. It's not quantitative. I'm not sitting there and counting the colonies. Um, it's just giving a rough idea as to how many colonies um, are on that plate at that exposure. And so let's take a look. So if I were to quantitate um, the amount of growth, I would say for the vegetative um, cells, plus, plus, plus. So we had a lot of growth at two seconds. At four seconds, we would still have a lot. Um, at eight seconds, we get a little bit less. 15 looks roughly the same if we're only using a four plus system. 30 seconds plus plus. Um, 60 seconds will give one plus. It had just a little bit. And then 90 seconds had nothing. When we compare that with the endospores, 15 seconds plus 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 plus. So four pluses. Uh, endospores, 30 seconds plus 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 plus. 60 seconds, we'll, we're going to give three pluses. 90 seconds, we're going to give two pluses. 120, we're going to give two pluses. 180, we're going to give one plus. We still had some, but by 240, um, we didn't really see colonies on the plate. And so again, if you look at these exposures, 90 seconds in the vegetative cells did not have anything. But if I compare that to 90 seconds on the endospore, it still had quite a bit. And same thing if I look at 60. 60 seconds for the endospores, I had three pluses. If I look at the vegetative cells, um, it only had a very small amount of bacteria. And so basically what this experiment tells us is that um, endospores are more resistant to UV light than the vegetative cells. And that should make sense with you. Um, for what you've learned about the function of endospores. And so it makes sense that you would expect to see that the endospores are more resistant to UV light. And in fact, they are.